Welcome to Heartbreak and Hope with Pat Barbarito, the show that explores how to build up or break down any relationship with confidence, clarity, and compassion. There's no better way to bring on heartbreak than experiencing grief. Grief, especially brought on by the loss of a loved one, uh, its impact upon the body, the spirit, the soul is profound. And anyone who's experienced the death of a close loved one really understands that. The pain is indescribable. But grief is an inevitable part of life, especially as we age. Today's guests are inspiring examples of the hope that could follow heartbreak and grief. Today, we have with us Tony Tambasco and Ann Stewart. Tony is a native New Yorker and a grandson of Italian immigrants. Interestingly, Tony's early desire was to be a priest, and he trained in theology and biblical studies. But life had other plans for him. He left the priesthood community, and he became a faculty member at Georgetown University, where he taught for over 35 years. And along the way, in 1980, he married Joan, a former nun. They settled into Arlington, Virginia, and Joan developed some neurological problems in the late 90s. Tony, ever the caretaker and devoted husband, investigated a community that could sustain both of them. They found the community of Goodwin House in Virginia. And there, they settled into a life that worked. Joan was able to be cared for, They had an active social life. They had friends. Joan passed away in 2012. Tony remains actively involved in the Goodwin House community. He participates in the chorus, spiritual life. He lectures. He's what I would call a renaissance man. And he's an entertainer. He's an active member of various boards, and he has a rich and open heart. Now, you may say, why is Tony a guest on this podcast? Well, life is funny. And enter Ann Stewart also from New York, and went to Duke University. And while studying there to be a nurse, her social conscience was awakened. She witnessed outrage at segregation she experienced while studying in North Carolina. She married Don Stewart while still in college, and he pursued his studies in neurosurgery. And that social consciousness, that experience in North Carolina, it stayed with her and stays with her throughout her life. As a young wife and mother, she found time to run a free clinic, She volunteered as a nurse, eventually started a women's group, and she's been an active member of the community. And when Anne's husband, Don, was diagnosed with a progressive muscle disease while he was still in his 50s, Anne did what she does. She was resourceful. She secured a job in Washington, D.C. when the kids were out of college, and she moved to Arlington, Virginia. Her husband, Don's deteriorating health, ended up directing her to Goodwin House, where she and Don lived until his passing. This is where the puzzle gets put together. Anne and Don knew Tony and Joan. They had dinners together. They knew each other socially. And now we're getting a little more interesting, aren't we? And that's where today's podcast takes off. So let's start with some basic information to give us some context. You're married. How did that happen? (laughs) I want to know the details. What happened? (laughs) Well, I I guess I can begin. Just before we got married, they asked us to co-chair the Employee Gift Fund, and that was funny in itself because neither of us had volunteered to co-chair the Employee Gift Fund. Just so you know what that is, we're not allowed to give any tips to any of the help in the house here. Uh, We have wait staff, we have a barber shop, we have all kinds of uh, uh, facilities that care for us, and we're not allowed to tip anybody in the house. So once a year... We have this gigantic fundraising operation, which tries to raise funds to give gifts to all of the employees at Goodwin House. And so this one year, the fellow tried to recruit us. And so he did that by using each of us as a hook for the other one. So neither of us had volunteered to co-chair the Employee Gift Fund. But by the time we finished, we uh, both uh, said, well, this other person seems nice to work with. And so we uh, both co-chaired the Employee Gift Fund. And then I just like to joke that a lot more came out of the Employee Gift Fund than we anticipated because I got to know Anne very well. And then by the end of the Employee Gift Fund, we were dating each other and and that led to marriage. I want to ask, when you were each asked to chair that gift fund, did you think, hmm, this should be interesting? 
She's kind of nice. <laughs> when he called me, I said uh, I felt like I owed the institution something. They had been really terrific caring for my husband. It was difficult. And I said, well, who would be the co-chair? And this guy said, oh, Tony, Tony Tombasco. And I thought exactly that. Well, he'd be fun to work with. And then I found out, because we decided to entertain some of the volunteers, and one day we were trying to entertain a whole group of them, and Tony said, well, I'll make the lasagna if you have it in your apartment. And I thought, oh my gosh, he cooks. So <laughs> that was a big drop. <laughs> Did you think of him? sort of in a dating sense or oh no 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 not no. then no no in, in fact even when I, <laughs> I i told her at the end of this whole process you know we, we were having lasagna dinners we were entertaining all the volunteers in our apartments back and forth and uh i finally sat down at the end of all of that and i said i'm smitten with you <laughs> and she oh. went oh Oh, oh. <laughs> I love that word. You said. I thought, oh, no, oh, no. So this took a little while. <laughs> How long did it take you to accept that he was smitten? I honestly remember practically running away. Um, <laughs> I'm a docent at the Library of Congress, and I think that was my day. I just sort of drove out of here and went up on uh, Capitol Hill and wandered around by myself <laughs> and thought, what am I going to do? But Tony was about to leave on a three-week trip to Italy, I think. Yeah, I, I had never seen the Amalfi Coast and uh, Sicily, and so I booked a tour to go to the Amalfi Coast in Sicily. <laughs> and I think, uh, first of all, I learned he really liked to travel, and I do too, <laughs> And it gave me some space to think about things. And then we were emailing each other. I don't think texting at that point, but right. emailing each other. And he's a very good writer. <laughs> and it gave me three weeks, at least, to think about this and think, well, okay, maybe it's safe to do this. I think when you've been through a traumatic experience and I was a little closer to it than Tony just his wife had died several years earlier yeah. but I was never going to get married again sometimes it just takes a while to let it sink in and tell yourself that it's okay that you do have a life ahead of you and it can be fun and safe and not a trauma. I think that's the most hopeful and optimistic yeah. part of this story, that you were able to accept that and allow yourself to feel that. Go ahead, Tony. I'm sorry. I had a similar kind of experience uh, that I guess somewhat prepared me uh, for all of this. Uh, first of all, I never expected that I was going to marry again, I, and I, I wasn't dating anybody, and it, it just wasn't on the horizon at all. And then what happened, and this was before I you know, I got serious about Anne. But what happened was uh, after a couple of years, a friend of a friend tried to hook me up with a date. And I mean, I had never thought about any of this. And then when I got invited to go on this date, I didn't ultimately go. But I said, oh, well, I guess it's okay, you know, to start thinking about that. And so that kind of opened things up. And then when Anne came along, you know, I had that other experience earlier. So it kind of prepared me in, in my own way to kind of recognize that maybe, you know, there's, there's another another future that, that was waiting for me. And so then I was traveling in on the Amalfi Coast and taking pictures, you know, of the the Greek gods that were in love with each other and, you know, and finding other kinds of romantic things and sending photos back and little love notes and <laughs> just trying to wear her out a little bit at a time. <laughs> and so by the time I got back, I think things were, were a little bit it, better. It, it worked. It worked. <laughs> by the time he got back, did you see him a little bit differently because of the time and the space? Honestly, I did. I recognized that I actually missed him. I looked forward to the emails, and it was a turning point. Now, mind you, I still wasn't thinking about marriage. Well, That's we're going to sure. talk about that. That's part of the fascination of your story. Marriage is a whole different level of a relationship. But before you got there, 
did when he came back, did it get immediately exclusive or serious? The thing about age, and I'm a little younger than you, but I, I think, that, and let's talk about how old are you both, if you don't mind me asking. Right now, I'm 83. When we was first dating, I guess what? I was 78? Yeah. I think, yeah. And how and I uh, just had my big birthday in December. I'm 80. Sometimes that's hard for me to believe, but I am. <laughs> and I remember the night before our wedding, which was in 2016, New Year's Eve, because all the family was here, I celebrated my 75th birthday. So I was 73 or four or so when when we started I think, dating. you know, my experience in speaking with people and my own personal experience, I'm in my mid-60s, is as we get older, there's sort of an acceleration of the dating because we don't have the time to, you know, date around or figure out if we like somebody within two years. So what I've been shocked at at 65 is kind of got to make the decision quickly because you don't have five or 10 years and you want to do things and enjoy life. Did you feel yeah. like that? Did you feel like this is it? We love each other. Let's get going. Absolutely. Honestly, that was exactly the way I felt. But that's what the three weeks did for me, you yeah. know, that I could honestly think about it and put my life in perspective. You know, I think you have to learn about someone and when you have shared values and simple things, everyday living, but also love of travel and family. So you both live in the same community and in, in independent living, obviously. Why get married? Why not just say, this is great. He's down the hall. We can do what we want. We have some independence. There are, there are two sides of the conversation. People say, I'll never get married. And people will say, I want to get married, especially as you're older. So what was your thought process, if I may ask? Well, when he asked me, that was exactly my thought process. Why get married? Yeah. yeah <laughs> so that married? took time, too. And I remember saying that we had to think about family, money, living arrangements, and religion. religion. So those were all important things that we had to discuss when he asked me to marry him. And when you talk about those topics, I ask both of you, what did you think about, about family, about money, about religion, about being with somebody every day? What was, what was going through your mind? Cause again, I think of myself, I think, I don't, I don't know if I can ever live with somebody anymore. It's hard. So what were you thinking about? Yeah, well, I mean, in my own mind, I, I guess in some ways I was very traditional. I said, well, if you're in love with her and you want to share your life, then it's time to just go whole hog into it and, and to make a commitment. So I, I didn't really think that there were alternates, although I, I guess, you know, not naive, I could kind of look around and see that there were alternates. In fact, we have other people in, the, in our building uh, that are kind of paired off, but they keep their own apartments. But I, I guess, I first of all, I thought some of the legal stuff, you know, that all gets more complicated if you're not married. But I also thought that it's not really kind of a total sharing of life together. You know, to keep my own apartment and to come down and visit just didn't seem to me the total gift. So for me, uh, thinking in very traditional categories and then adding on all the legal sides of it, I, I just wanted to enter into a, a total marriage. So do you think, Tony, that's, you know, some of that old Italian Catholic? I mean, you trained to be the priesthood. I, I'll bet I, you that was there. In fact, uh, you know, at one point, Anne had to tell the kids, you know, that we were dating. And the first thing they thought was that she was joking because <laughs> she was never going to marry again, you know. Oh, no, wait. And, so, so that's fa the families. Who has children? Do either of you, both of you have children? I, I had no children, but Anne, Anne has four and she has 10 grandchildren. So she had to negotiate all of that. Well, when Anne was telling the kids, you know, first of all, they thought she was joking. And then after that, I guess some of the kids were saying, well, so then you could live together or, you know, you could kind of visit each other or, you know, whatever. And one of them <laughs> piped up and said, no, no, Tony is traditional. He's going to want to get married. <laughs> so, Anne, how did your children deal with that? How did they? You know, I... It's a lot. It's a lot, but I am so lucky. I have four 
really terrific adult children. They're all happily married, and they all have kids themselves. You know, I think it was the fact that they were so supportive when I was going through those many years of my husband's, their father's illness. And they were right there with me. And they knew it was a struggle. One of the things that my son said, he was the oldest, he's an ophthalmologist. And uh, he said, you know, mom, I take care of a lot of older people. And I see that sometimes when their spouse dies, that they stop living. He said, honestly, I'm really thrilled for you because you're going ahead. You're living your life. That really resonated with me. But all the kids were supportive. And when we got married, we had all of them come to the wedding, all of Tony's family, all the girl grandchildren were in the wedding and Tony's niece. And I had met Tony's family, too. Yeah, there was a great deal of support on 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 both sides of the uh, mm-hmm. of the family, and I I always joke, you know, that I uh, I didn't have any children, so I got four kids, but I got them past all the problems, you know, of teenage years and all of that, and then ten grandchildren, and they're all fairly well grown up, so I'm not even dealing with that. So we're just making the rounds of weddings, uh, graduations, and then you know we hope weddings will be coming on the scene. So I got them all at a good time. You know, family is the ultimate gift. Again, something we learn as we get older. But what a gift to both of you. And you have somebody to share all these events with. And Tony, you have somebody to experience them with. It's an extraordinarily optimistic story. And I I didn't uh, notice it in myself, but people told me that I had kind of a lightest step and I I looked a lot more happy and, you know. We also told the children that we would sign a prenup. I mean, that was part of the financial thing. So we did sign a prenup, and we do travel a lot, for example, but we both put in our half to do that. So we split expenses, but we also have our own financial things that we do. We have our own financial advisors, and that's... You know, it's not the same as getting married when you're just starting out and trying to start a family and so forth. So, you know, Anne, I, I really am uh, so appreciative that you shared that. It's kind of a touchy subject that people don't like to talk about it, but it's the most practical thing yeah. anybody could do. Even simple things like, look, we always say marriages end of one of two ways. Divorce, which is extraordinarily not likely. It's not going to happen here. People die. And This way, everybody knows what's going to happen. Yes. Also, you sign things as simple as if you're not married, who could come in the room to be with you? Who could make decisions? So once all that's laid out, it takes away so much of the stress. I I have such admiration for you doing that and talking about it. And I, I thank you for that. Was that something that helped ease the transition for both of you and the children? I mean, we had decided to do it. And so we told the children And we did update our various powers of attorney and end-of-life documents that we have. We need to have those when we live in this retirement community. We just said that we were doing that. So finances were not an issue with the children. And once that's off the table, you know, it's easier to move forward. Yes. enjoy life a little bit. Before you got together, you independently traveled extensively, I understand? Yes. Tell us some places you've been. I I have to say, just parenthetically, that Anne traveled with her husband in an electric wheelchair, a scooter, and she traveled to places like Thailand. So, I I mean, you you talk about heroic movements and uh, and dedication to a husband. My wife was uh, a lot easier to maneuver uh, she lived with me all the way until the time she died, you know, in our apartment. And she was a wisp. I could move her around very easily. But anyway, I I did my travel in, in earlier years when my wife was still well. I would go off to conventions. So most of my travel was internal to the country. But we visited lots of the states and uh, lots of the, uh, you know, prominent cities in the country because I would go off to convention and my wife would come with me. And then we would take a week before or after to kind of do sightseeing and things of that sort. And now that I've married Anne, we're just 
covering the whole rest of the world that we haven't seen. So we're, we're having difficulty finding places that one of us hasn't been to already. But uh, <laughs> oh, tell our audience, where have you been since you've gotten together? And joined me first on the Baltic Capitals. We, uh, they're all organized tours that we go on. You know, we like people to prepare the hotels and all the sites and everything. So we go on organized tours. Uh, so we did the Baltic Capitals. We've done the German Christmas markets. We've done uh, Scandinavia, Norway, and uh, up the Arctic. We went to Antarctica. Wow, press. Where else? We've done Northern Italy. Oh, Alaska. We've Alaska. Done... I understand you have a trip coming up in your future. Galapagos. Uh, I also started because I lived here at Goodwin House, and my husband was um, on the skilled nursing floor. I saw a, an ad for a trip. It was just five days hiking in the Adirondacks. And I remember someone saying to me, maybe the therapist I found, because I had a therapist to help me get through this. It was so difficult. Uh, remember what you liked to do when you were young and growing up. And I used to go to a girls camp in the Adirondacks. So I went back and we climbed mountains, and I went back the next year. It was only five days. Uh, I drove back the next year and went on a canoe trip. Then I started hiking with a group, though, with an organized group. I went to Death Valley, and I went along the coast of Croatia, and I took one of my girls with me to Italy and Austria in the mountains hiking. So we did Lots of things like that. But that was because someone was here taking care of him. Goodwin House really saved my life. I had been caring for him at home for a long time. And because I was a nurse, I think I could do all of this. He was, you know, in a wheelchair. I used something called a Hoyer lift. He had to be fed. We had aids in the house, but it sounds easy to get an aid in the house. It is not easy. So I called when I wasn't sleeping at night. I called an experienced geriatric care manager, and she kind of gave me permission, saying that, yes, he did need full-time care. I was working for a university. I had changed careers. i gotten a master's in public administration, and I stayed and, and worked for the university. I was um, helping grad students find jobs and working with alumni. And when I moved to Washington, one of the reasons was that they had offered me a job here. So I was still working part-time. I wasn't sleeping at night, and that finally did it. I just couldn't cope any longer. This person highly recommended the place that we're living in, Goodwin House, because of the excellent nursing care. So he went straight to skilled nursing. And you stayed in independent living? I, of course, had to sell the house uh, because when you don't walk into a continuing care retirement community or life plan community, you know, you have to pay for skilled nursing. It's very expensive. It's very expensive. He lived there for four and a half years. Where were you during that time? In the house or in the independent living? No, no. I sold the house immediately. I actually, it's a long story, but I had never seen Goodwin House. I I would have lived in a closet, but um, my girls picked out the apartment. I happened to be in a rental in Florida at that time for the winter just because it was easier uh, for him to get around. So I came to Goodwin House and they showed me my apartment and it was just, I just breathed a sigh of relief. You know, talk about destiny if you're not a person of faith and optimism, your story ending up in Goodwin House, yes. not only for your former husband's, your late husband's situation and Tony's late wife's situation, but just your quality of life and finding each other, it, it yes. is restorative of faith. I mean, you have to have faith to have had this experience. I'm interested in, Anne, you said something that I, I found very interesting that you were, you were encouraged to, and you did reconnect with your younger self. Yes. Um, and, and I loved that because we forget, don't we, as we get older, to reflect and connect. And it is a gift of age that yes. we can sit down and say, what did I like to do? Exactly. And when you do that, it 
you know, you feel 10 years younger or 20 years younger. So what a great suggestion. Well, and I also think because he was, it was a progressive muscle disease and because he was confined to a wheelchair, I realized that I had the gift of moving and I better keep it up. So I started going to a boot camp and I have one friend who's my age and everybody else is a whole lot younger than we are. I call myself the queen of modification, but I still go. So that's fun. And Tony and I have started playing pickleball. And... Oh, I love pickleball. I started it. So far. <laughs> I just started it this year and it's something I can do. I love it. <laughs> yeah. We go walking. I think both of us realize that keeping your body up is an important thing to do and it is a gift to have good health and to be able to move yes and to be able to have somebody to move with to walk with to talk to or to not talk at all uh you're part of the goodwin house community you're obviously both very independent together and apart i'm curious what is your life in your community look like at goodwin house because as i said in the introduction you're very involved at a lot of levels. So tell us a little bit about what your life looks like in terms of activities and uh, involvement. I'm amazed at the political involvement, the social consciousness. Tell us about that. I was in one discussion group and uh, people were trying to make the point about how life is vibrant here and that, you know, you're just not coming here to kind of be passive and, and die in your apartment. And so one fellow piped up and he said, I didn't come here to die. And there was this big silence and everybody looked around and we all burst out laughing because in point of fact, we're in a retirement home where we're probably going to die, you know. But uh, the, point, the point that he was making is that there's a whole lot of life that's going on before you die. And in fact, one of the things that they tried to do here at Goodwin House, they've kind of talked about what they call squaring the curve. In other words, what they're trying to do is instead of having life as kind of a slow decline that goes for years and years and years and you just kind of fade out, what they want to do is keep you vibrant so that your life is on an even keel and it keeps going until it doesn't. So, so they of encouragement in that area. You do seem to be pretty vibrant without that encouragement. I mean, when Anne goes off to boot camp, I pray that she comes back alive. <laughs> but I, I don't go to boot camp, but I but I walk around the block all the time and I and I do plenty of walking, you know, to try to keep active. And then I think the thing that keeps me young is that uh, I mean my philosophy in life was not even go back and think about what things were like in your youth. It, it was more like take each day as it comes. So when I when I had to care for my wife, I took that, but I, I didn't take it in such a way that I was going to stop living while I was taking care of my wife. I mean, I was still teaching at, uh, at Georgetown University. I, I was on the board in my condo. You know, I invited people over for dinners. I got a lot of support from neighbors around me, but even while I was taking care of her, I was trying to stay active. And then when we moved in here... I just got that added support. So what happened in a condo where we lived, because we had no children, life was was very quiet for my wife. I mean, when she got to the stage that she couldn't move around and she was in a wheelchair, she was, in effect, confined to the apartment. So even though I had caregivers with her, what could you do in a condo? I mean, there's, there's no activity going on because everybody is out doing their own things. So my wife was confined. And then uh, caregiving was kind of uncertain. So when Goodwin House came along, I, I had neighbors, people from church, whom I know arranged to kind of move in here. I had a colleague whose wife worked for the Association of Continuing Care Communities, so she could make recommendations. And then Goodwin House just had a stellar reputation uh, nationally, right? So I didn't even look very hard for a whole lot of other places. I just said, this is where I'm going to go. And it was at a time when they put a new building up, so there wasn't a long waiting list, and we could move in in a matter of months. When I moved here, I did not consider that now I went into a retirement community and all my life outside was going to stop. So, in, in fact, when I was still in my early 70s, I was still teaching at, uh, at Georgetown. And when I moved in here, I still taught at Georgetown. So I, I didn't retire until about five years ago. I've been 12 years in the retirement community. What did what, you teach? What did you I, I stayed in theology. Uh, you know, I had been in the priesthood and I, I had all my training in Rome and, uh, and in Paris and I did you know, biblical studies and theology, so I just stayed in it for my whole life. I guess I retired after about five years living here, 
and and now I'm still involved in the retired faculty, and I do non-credit courses for the neighborhood, and I, I, I chair a spiritual life committee here, and we try to do ecumenical and interreligious and, uh, you know, philosophical, sociological discussions of basic issues of human life. One of the things you said you had to think about before marriage, one of the topics, you said family, money, and religion. Yeah. What was it that you had to think about with regard to religion in marrying Anne? Right. And Anne is Episcopalian, and I, you know, I remained Roman Catholic, but I, I, I'm on, I guess you can call it the progressive side of Roman Catholicism. I, I mean, for me, the difference between the religions are not a lot of the essential things in terms of what faith means. And I, I think all the religions share that. Where they begin to differ is when you get to institutional, structural organization on how you're going to live that and how you're going to express it. And institutions and organizations change constantly, and every organization has some good to it and some bad to it. I could live with all of that, and so I share with Anne a whole lot of things that we have in common, and um, the structural issues, I've got as many problems as I have acceptance of, of what's going on in Catholicism, and in the Episcopal Church, I can see that they've got lots of good things that they can contribute, and they have their own headaches. So, you know, we go back and forth to each other's church. And what it's done is just expanded the communities for us because I, I know people in her church. I've led a book discussion for the Episcopal Church on, on, on faith and, and science. And uh, she comes to my church and she knows all of the people. I lead a book discussion group there and she knows all of those people. So uh, on, the, on the core issues, I think there's a great deal of ecumenical and interreligious commonality. You know, when we talk about religion, we kind of share those elements as really the important thing, and structures and institutions are secondary. I mean, I think that's well said. You know, it's interesting when I see people, and we see people here getting married, a second marriage, and doing prenuptials, they think about the money yeah. and practical things. Uh, I love that you two expanded it to family and religion, because yeah. those are as much foundational issues as money, and I'm not so sure people think those through as much. So, so that three prong test, family, money, and religion, I believe is a really sound way to think about entering a marriage, particularly a second marriage. You two had many interests, obviously, and, and extraordinarily interesting lives before you met and married. I'm curious, are there activities and what things did you discover together that you like to do? Or are there new experiences that you discovered as a couple that you enjoy doing that maybe you didn't do in your, I'll say, former life? A couple of things I, I would add when you asked before, when I moved in here, I don't think it was easy in the beginning. It was a relief that he was cared for. But I looked around and I was fairly young to move into a, a place like this. I was 68. And one of my daughters looked at me and she said, Mom, you've got a front door and a car. So I think moving into a retirement community meant, for us at least, that we continued with our lives. I was still working part-time. I have book clubs, friends. I was very active in my church. It's downtown Washington, and I was on the vestry and chaired the capital campaign. Moving into here added to my life. I met lots of friends. I got to know those people, and they have stories to tell, such interesting stories to tell. And, and I think you're older, you're not afraid to tell them, which is the best part. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and activities here that you can join, or you don't have to. You know, they have fitness. I So I go out, but I also do classes here. Both of us are on the Goodwin Living Foundation board. I think it's added to our life, but we haven't given up our friends that we had before. It's just like moving to a condo. One of the other things that I thought about was in addition to family and finances and so forth were living arrangements. And Tony invited before we got married and decided which apartment to live in. Tony cooked brunch for one of my daughters who lives locally in her family and showed us around all the closets and so forth. And afterwards, my daughter said, Mom, He's really organized. How's that going to go? <laughs> <laughs> so did you move into his or 
move into a new one or did he move into yours? No, I, I knew that I was going to lose the battle, you know. I So I was selling that I, I was up on a higher apartment. I had a balcony. I had a nice overview of Arlington. I had more closet space, but I knew that I was going to lose. So I moved into Anne's apartment, but I had to get my books down here and I had to get another walk-in closet and get my clothes down. So we couldn't touch her walk-in closets because of her shoes. So, <laughs> so... So we built another walk-in closet at one corner in, in the second bedroom. And then I moved my bookcases down here since they were portable. And we went to Ikea and got a, a reach-in closet in, in our bedroom. So she kept all of her walk-in closets intact. And I added my closets and I could move down here. As long as I got my books on my clothes, I was happy. And you made a new life together there. Yeah. yeah. And you know, you talked about things that we do together. And I think I, of mm -hmm. course learned so much about Tony and and his not only previous life but what he was doing here so that's something that we talk about together and I think we've both become pretty knowledgeable about senior living and not only here at Goodwin House but this community mm -hmm. is trying to reach out it's a faith-based community we're trying to reach out and uplift care for older adults in the larger community. What happens, I think, to a lot of people, men and women of a certain age, as that I'm in my 60s, but my, a lot of my friends, people I know in their 70s, they sort of get jaded about finding somebody. Oh, there's nobody out there. I can't meet anybody. And I'm extraordinarily optimistic in life. I feel there are so many good people. But I hope that what your story does in many ways is inspire people of a certain age to understand if you could find somebody, a good person with good values that you connect with, that you want to share life with, that you're respectful, that you love, your life can be so enriched. And listening to your story, I'm really hopeful because it's inspiring, but I don't think it's that unusual if we open our hearts. And one of the things I know that you are likely to say is, what is it that you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? <laughs> How did that saying get associated with you? Well, of course, that comes from a Mary Oliver poem. And actually, the first time, I'm sure I heard it before, but the first time it really sank in was I had a very good friend in upstate New York, and I still keep in touch with those people. I have a women's group and all of that. I still keep in touch. But this very good friend went through a similar experience. Her husband died, and he had been a good friend of mine, too, and my husband's. And she remarried. And the priest in the wedding ceremony quoted that. It's a last line of a Mary Oliver poem. And it just sort of got into my brain. And I thought, yeah, what are you going to do with your one wild, beautiful life? That's how you live your life, obviously. Well, honestly, I did think about that. Because when you've gone through a traumatic experience. I understand why you sort of look inside and shelter yourself for a while, just trying to heal. And so you have to have some things that open your eyes and look at the future. And Tony was it. I feel optimistic. I feel hopeful talking to the two of you. I'm so grateful that you agreed to share your story. I hope it inspires our listeners as it's inspired me. And I thank you so much for agreeing to come on Heartbreak and Hope and share with us this wonderful journey with uh, full of great optimism and a bright future. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's been just a pleasure. And thank you to you. We've never been on a podcast before. So. <laughs> <laughs> after this because I think this is a great story and I a new adventure. <laughs> to it because it's a beautiful story it's an inspiring story so thank you so much Good, and thank you for inviting us thank you so much for joining us today don't forget to follow us on your favorite podcast platform please give us a five star rating and leave a review so more people can listen in to Heartbreak and Hope with Pat Barbarito